Welcome to the UNC Third Annual Health and Human Rights Lecture. Established in 2001, this lecture series seeks to promote human rights under international law as a basis for public health, as a normative framework for governance. Our speakers have sought to shift the analysis of health policy debates from social justice to legal accountability, elevating human rights from principle to practice and transforming international law into national policy. I'm Benjamin Meyer, Assistant Professor of Public Policy here at UNC and a member of the Selection Committee for this groundbreaking lecture series. As part of our Interdisciplinary Selection Committee, listed in our burn book here, and working at the intersection of law, medicine, public health, and public policy, we're seeking to bring to campus global leaders in the application of human rights to public health. And I'm inspired to see so many students and faculty here today. With sponsorship from the Department of Bioethics, the Department of Public Policy, the Global Research Institute, the Gillen School of Global Health, I need to thank the many people who made this possible, many of whom are still standing outside handing out programs. Deanna Knowles, Molly Smith, Glenn Coco, Naya Real, for all their work to make this amazing event happen each year. Our inaugural event brought to campus Sophia Gruskin to discuss the application of human rights to health and the efforts to secure access to essential medicines. In our second year, we worked with UNC's Pan Campus Water Feed, bringing to campus Katarina de Albuquerque, the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to safe drinking water and sanitation, to speak about her human rights mandate under the United Nations and these crucial determinants of health that she seeks to elevate in public policy discourse. In this third year, proving that the limit does not exist, we brought to UNC one of the preeminent leaders who brought the intersection of global health and human rights into legal discourse, who has brought a new book to our academic discourse that will serve as a foundation to the development of a new discipline in global health law. It's so fetch. <laughs> so, moving already beyond my small task this afternoon, I need to introduce you to Eric Jones, the director of the UNC Center for Bioethics, who is going to welcome our speaker here and introduce you, Professor Lawrence Gosta. Thank you very much, Eric. Good afternoon. I'm Eric Jones. I direct the UNC Center for Bioethics. And we're really uh, delighted to be co-sponsoring this series. It's, no, it's uh, an open secret, I think, that the series is a brainchild of Ben Meyer. And uh, he's been uh, the key ingredient in bringing these great speakers to campus. His network is fabulous. But I also have a long history with Larry Gostin. Uh, we in bioethics count him as a member of our clan, although he's uh, a member of many academic and professional clans and uh, goes well beyond the academic boundaries of thinking about ethical issues in the life sciences to actually trying to do something about them, which uh, makes him a, a prized possession for our field. <laughs> Larry is uh, the university professor and holder of the O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law at Georgetown University. He directs the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, and he has professorial appointments at universities around the world, including Oxford, Melbourne in Australia, and uh, Witterstrand in um, South Africa. He's the director of the World Health Organization's Collaborating Center on Public Health Law and Human Rights. So for those of you involved in the uh, mock 
WHO exercise coming up this weekend. Uh, this is your go-to uh, expert. He's gotten lots of honorary degrees. He's festooned with awards and prizes, which you can read about in your program. Uh, I think probably my favorite must be his um, Elbridge Memorial Award from the UK as the person, quote, who has most influenced parliament and government to act for the welfare of society. Wow. And there's no time limit specified. <laughs> His latest book is Global Health Law, and it's for sale in the lobby. You'll have a chance to get your own personalized signed copy uh, after the lecture. But meanwhile, let's bring him on, Larry. Thank you. A young friend and a, I should say, a new friend or not. We're not an old friend, but you're, we've known each other a long, long time. Um, uh, uh, ben and Eric are, are very dear friends of mine, and uh, it actually is, it actually, of all the things you said about me, Eric, but I thought the, the thing that warmed me the most was is that I was a member of all these clans. <laughs> and to be a member of your clan on ethics and Ben's clan on human rights and governance is just a great privilege for me. And it's also a great privilege uh, for me to be here at UNC. I, I am, uh, I do go to Duke, so that's a <laughs> disclosure. <laughs> um, but I have a great fondness uh, for uh, the Tar Heels and UNC, and it's, it's really, really wonderful to be back. Um, and I've got many, many friends here, uh, Gene Matthews and Tulsi and many, many others. Uh, uh, and uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the last uh, chapter of my book. Uh, and uh, I'll essentially um, begin by talking about what I perceive to be the, the, the prevailing global health narratives today. And then I'm going to ask in the chapter, I ask three fundamental questions. Uh, here, I, I think I'll only have time for two, and I'll let Ben answer the third one. <laughs> um, and and, uh, uh, and then I'm going to finish uh, with uh, a discussion of, if I have time, uh, the current Ebola uh, epidemic, and uh, also the isolated cases here in the United States. Uh, in a way, it's the best and the worst time for me to be away from home because, as, as uh, my friends know, I, I've just been uh, inundated uh, with discussions about um, Ebola. And uh, so, uh, and, and I don't know if do you get Diane in here? Yes, sure. Yeah. So I'll be there on Monday talking about, about this topic, so you can listen in if you want. Uh, so let me begin um, by talking about what I perceive to be two global health narratives. And, and the reason that I want to begin with these narratives um, is that they're, they're contradictory narratives and yet both are true, uh, which is a, a, it's something I think to take note of. So this is the prevailing narrative. I don't know if you've heard, uh, well, well, about four or five months ago, uh, Bill Gates and the West and Michael Bloomberg or a charm offensive uh, uh, on the media talking about this narrative. But the same narrative uh, we hear from the head of uh, 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 WHO, we hear it from uh, USAID, we hear it from all the great and the good in global health. And that is a story of stunning success uh, over the last five to 10 years. And there has been stunning success in global health. Um, we've dramatically uh, curtailed um, uh, morbidity and mortality uh, among uh, uh, women, women childbearing women uh, and uh, children. Uh, we have uh, done uh, so much for uh, uh, communicable diseases, uh, uh, particularly AIDS. With, uh, you know, over 10 million people on anti antiretrovirals, which we could never have even 
uh, dreamed about before. Um, we, uh, the Gabby Alliance has made, made very great strides um, with uh, getting preventable uh, childhood vaccines uh, to people around the world. Uh, it really has been a stunning success, and among the most stunning parts of that success uh, is the fact that we have a, a significant decrease in poverty around the world and a significant increase uh, in um, uh, life expectancy. And that is true uh, in, in, in uh, richer and uh, poor countries alike. Uh, so that is one global health narrative. It's, it's an undoubtedly true one. When Bill Gates talks about that narrative, is intended to say, let's not give up. Um, what we're doing really, really works. And I think that that's true. And it's an opportune time to say that because uh, in 2015 uh, uh, will be the expiration of the Millennium Development Goals. And if one looks at the successes in global health and uh, from the uh, uh, University of Washington, some really interesting uh, work that showed an enormous increase in global health spending over the last decade. Most of that increase in spending has been very closely tied to the specific health targets of the MDGs. And I think that that's uh, really significant. And uh, the uh, United Nations is now moving toward uh, sustainable development goals. Our, our global health community, um, you know, I, by the way, I love the fact that uh, uh, the public health school is changing its name to Global Public Health. I just think that is you know, your rock stars for doing that. Um, it's, it's wonderful. Um, the SDGs, or the Sustainable Development Goals, we do have a big fight among the global health community about those. What, what will they be? Will they be universal coverage? Will they be universal health coverage? Will they be... Um, a, 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 a um, healthy lifespan, which is in Jeff Sachs' talks. Uh, WHO wants universal health coverage. Jeff Sachs wants uh, uh, life, uh, a healthy life expectancy. And Bill Gates wants neither. He wants very measurable goals like um, uh, child mortality or, um, or, or uh, uh, maternal health uh, or AIDS. And the AIDS community wants AIDS. Uh, the non-communal global disease community wants AIDS and D's. It's a bit of a mess at the moment. And I have to I spend some time with that community. And I have an idea where they will go, but we still don't know uh, exactly uh, where they will head. But it's a very, very important narrative. So, but there's another narrative, and that's a narrative of continuing huge inequalities in health and lives filled um, with suffering and ill health. Uh, and it's interesting because I work both with the global health good, you know, the global health leaders, but also with civil society. And when I and what led me to these two narratives is that when I'm with one group I hear one thing and when I hear another when I go to civil society they just they hate the WHO, they hate Bill Gates. I mean, that, that I don't think they should, but they do. Uh, I once, you know, at, in Johannesburg, when I gave a talk uh, at when a big civil society meeting, they were all wearing these really, um, you know, in your face t shirts, you know, AIDS t shirts. So when I got on, I thought, well, I'll wear my t shirt, which was a WHO t shirt. And they booed me, because on the back they had the right to help with the 12 languages. But Give the talk that way. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to give you um, a sense of this other narrative. And when Harvard University Press, um, when I finished the book and we were talking about a forward, I suggested Margaret Chan or Michael Bloomberg, somebody like that. And the best thing that Harvard ever said to me was, nobody cares what. Bill Gates says, nobody cares what Michael Bloomberg says, or, or less so Margaret Chan. Think of something else. And so I had to go back to the drawing board, and what I did, and I actually think it's the best part of the book, the first 15 pages, 
and that's because I didn't write it. <laughs> um, that's the best part of the book because what we did is we went around the world uh, in Latin America, Asia, Africa, uh, and we asked young people to tell us what their lives were like. What's a day in your life, in your own words? And so what we call, I call this in the book, Global Health Narratives. And I thought that I would just uh, read you um, two uh, quick ones, uh, and then, uh, and then um, we'll launch the rest of uh, the talk. So the first one is uh, Namarumbu, uh, and she's a, uh, a, a young uh, female living in the Gaba, which is like a suburb of Kampala. She writes, I live in a very rowdy place. No clean water, no good toilets or bathrooms. I have to move a long distance every day looking for clean water to bathe, to cook. At night, the conditions worsen. There is hardly any electricity. The mosquito noise fills up the place. Cockroaches move around me and it makes me sick. Even when I fall ill, I hardly ever go to hospital. My mother, who would have helped me out with the medication fees, is living with HIV AIDS. Life is too hard, too complicated for me. I have to cook food for my brother and myself. This forces me to cook one meal a day for a lack of money to access the food we need to be well. I need to get healthy. A lot of violence happens to my friends and me, and we were raped and robbed, and our property was stolen. I'm thinking of getting a job. However, the salary is too small, and I will be so sad. I really need a new life. And one of the things that I wanted to do is to convey, particularly to young people like you, that Health isn't just out there. Global health is here in the United States. I mean, you can see, uh, even for a very rich country in Dallas, we've really not performed all that well um, uh, in dealing with very isolated uh, Ebola cases and, or, and exposed cases. Um, but in some parts of America, it is really desperate and very, very hard. And I wanted to give an idea of what it's like in rich countries as well, because most of the global health disparities around the world are actually within countries, certainly among them, but within them, places like Brazil, India, the United States. And this is Johnny's story. I spent, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, living uh, on a, uh, uh, the Blackfeet and other Indian reservations, Blackfeet reservations in Montana. And I hope you will ask me questions about the Blackfeet re reservation because from a public health perspective, it is truly shocking. Just for example, what, what do you think the life expectancy of a, of a male is at, at birth? 47 years old. Um, what do you think the chances are that a baby born in the tribal hospital um, will have either uh, dependency on uh, uh, drugs or fetal alcohol syndrome, something like 85%, just throwing away the next generation. So this is what John says. Try to beat my best American accent. I start my days with a cup of joe. Then I corral, ride, and break horses and I smoke a bowl of weed about six or seven times if I have it. Otherwise, I smoke whatever shows up. It's a stress reliever. My father uses drugs, snorts cocaine in front of me, takes my birthday money. He even did a line of coke with me, and he used alcohol since before I was born. My dad was abusive to all of us. He was verbally abusive, and he beat us with the belt. When your family is broken due to drugs and alcohol, everyone is hurt. It makes me mad when people in the community do the heavier drugs. What I mean is, what little kids get to eat or not to eat, do they get shoes or clothes or meat? It depends on whether the adults do drugs. I know it can't be stopped, but it's unfair that the grown-ups get what they want and the children do without. I want to shout, hey, when you do meth, don't let your kids be there. 
If I could, I would turn our reservation into a dry reservation and no gambling. My life is gone, but what about the kids? So I think you can see that's not what you hear from Bill Gates, WHO, and others. It's a different narrative, and yet both are true. Uh, I had a lot of trouble when I finished the book thinking about what the last chapter should be. Um, and I just really struggled with it. Uh, and I realized that there were three fundamental questions and I really wanted to oversimplify. Since the book is not oversimplified throughout, I thought some, sometimes when you have simplifying um, assumptions and questions, uh, that it can be very clarifying. And sometimes scholars don't appreciate that. Uh, and if, if we can answer three questions in anywhere near uh, an approximately a polite way, uh, we could make enormous progress in uh, global health. The first question is, what would an ideal state of global health look like? And that may seem like an odd question to you, um, but I'm going to answer it in a way and try to demonstrate that it's exactly what the right answer is, is exactly the opposite of what we do in global health today. Uh, the second question is one that's not really asked that often, but needs to be, is what would global health with justice look like? Sometimes people talk about global health justice or global health equity or, or social disparities or health disparities. But I intentionally use the idea of global health with justice because you can achieve relatively high levels of global health and yet lack justice, and vice versa. Uh, and I think that that's an important insight. The third thing, uh, and this is the hard part, which I'm going to leave for them, <laughs> um, which is but discussed a whole lot in the book, is uh, if we knew what an ideal state of global health with justice would be like, um, how would we get there? What are the kinds of innovative tools that we would need? And I might just refer to some of these when we talk about Ebola, which I think is just the most preventable uh, uh, epidemic I've seen in a long time, and, and it's been badly bumbled. Um, and actually, on Tuesday, I have an article coming out in the Lancet, just really talk, if you're interested in Ebola, talking about what are the lessons learned, you know, how have we got it wrong, what what could we have done, and what should we do now? Um, so the first question I wanted to ask is, what would global health with justice look like? Uh, that, or global health look like? A state, an ideal state of global health. It seems to me there are three things, not kind of controversial, there are basically three things that make people healthy. Um, uh, that, or as the Institute of Medicine said, a short of conditions in which people can be healthy because nothing can make them healthy. The first um, is adequate health care, treatment, essential medicines, primary care, safe um, uh, births, um, things like that. Uh, and the whole idea of uh, alma mater and, and um, primary care that WHO has done and now is transformed into universal health coverage. The really focus is very much on that part of healthcare. Um, medicine, doctors, nurses, medicines, hospitals, and all that. And that is an important part of what makes a person healthy. The one that people tend to focus on almost exclusively though, know, and there are two more both of which I think are much more powerful. The second one are public health services. Uh, things like sanitation, clean water, nutritious food, um, uh, uh, vector abatement, mosquito abatement, um, uh, tobacco control, alcohol control, injury prevention. All of these things are not what doctors, nurses, hospitals do. They're what? 
big, strong public health agencies do. And they're critically important, and they tend to be ignored. The third thing, and this is probably the most important thing, but as you're going to see in a moment, I'm going to take it off the table now, because it has very little to do with the health system at all. Um, these are the social determinants of health. These are things like um, employment, income, education, um, uh, uh, all of the things that <coughs> make for a, uh, for a good social status. And social status and, in, and, and, and socioeconomic status are very important. Um, so for example, if any of you have been to Washington, D.C., um, you know the red line that goes from poor Southeast D.C. to rich Northwest D.C. by NIH and things like that? Well, for every stop on the red line, um, the population on that stop that exits there um, has an, uh, a life expectancy three or four years longer than the stop before. And that's really remarkable. But it turns out, of course, that it's not just absolute um, socioeconomic status. It also is relative socioeconomic status. So it turns out, for example, that equally uh, well-off uh, movie stars, uh, if one is nominated for an Oscar and the other isn't, the one that's nominated lives longer. And if you actually win the Academy Award, you live longer than if you were just nominated. Uh, so there's something about relativism with your peers. I have in my public health book that I don't have it on me, but I have a very great quote from the Times of London, you know, talking about how you need to um, uh, make sure that you're better off than your neighbors, and that when you go to a restaurant, that the mayor do knows just how special you are. Um, but it was very, very Times of London uh, week. But the question is, is how would we prioritize these services? Now, clearly, I would prioritize the third one. So, for example, when people ask me, what the one, if you could wave a magic wand, what the one thing you would do for global health? I would say, well, that's easy, educate women. Um, that would be just um, a, a simple way because we know that women take care of themselves, they take care of their families, and educated women have healthier families, healthier communities. But I want to take social economic uh, determinants off the table for the moment because they're not in the health system. And ask the question, if we want to organize the health system, what should be the priority between um, uh, public health and global health? At the moment, all the priority is on um, um, uh, health care rather than on uh, public health population-based um, services. One sees that almost everywhere. Uh, and the way we organize global health today not only doesn't provide health care, but it actually is even narrower than that. We, we're siloed into diseases. We look at antiretrovirals to AIDS. We look at tuberculosis. If that tends, if it pops up in a Ebola epidemic, we'll, link, we'll just jump on the Ebola epidemic. But there's nothing that has in, in it enduring healthcare systems that are strong and stable. That would stop Ebola, that would prevent and treat um, non-communicable diseases and things like that. But the question is, between public health and healthcare, which is the more important, and I have to, I've always had trouble, I'm sure if you, the people in the public health school here will understand that. When you try to explain what the public health approach, people's eyes glaze over. It is not, and not, not, a, not an attractive thing. And so I, I thought, well, maybe what I should do, I was walking on the CNO Canal in, with my wife in Washington, it popped into my head that I should, if I used a simplifying Rawlsian experiment, that people would get the idea. And so I've done this uh, Rawlsian thought. Uh, experiment. I typically have it. I've done it in every region of the world. I've done it in Beijing, Shanghai, Delhi, um, Argentina, Colombia. Uh, done it in, in uh, just literally everywhere. And uh, I went 
tell you the outcome, but every society chooses the same thing. Okay, so you have two choices. Do you want to know? Everybody know John Rawls' Veil of Ignorance? Um, so basically, uh, you have to imagine yourself in a state um, where you don't know what your circumstances are. You don't know if you're black, white, red, choices and you need to choose one, Rawls postulates that you will choose the one that's most just. Uh, and so the first one is you can you can uh, have the access to all the greatest services in the world. You can go to the see hospital, you go to John's hospital, you can go to the clinic, um, you can get the best surgeons, the best cancer drugs, doesn't matter what it costs, you can get all the medical care. I'm going to be wandering around, this is not picking up. It's not picking up at all. And so I have this. It wasn't there, it wasn't. <laughs> 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 all the medical care in the world. Yeah. <laughs> so all the technology. And so you can get all the medical care in the world if you want. Um, or you could never see a doctor again the rest of your life. Um, but instead, you would wake up every morning, you would turn on the tap, and then you'd clean the water. They'd be flushing toilet, um, you would have nutritious food, you would walk outside the door and you wouldn't be um, accosted by malaria or mosquitoes, um, you wouldn't um, uh, uh, have uh, uh, plague ridden uh, rats, there wouldn't be rubbish all over the streets, when you, when you drove your car there would be safe roads uh, and safe uh, cars to drive in. Um, in short, the public health approach. You wouldn't have tobacco smoke everywhere. Uh, and if you had those two choices, who would choose choice number one, all the health care they could get? There's usually one. Um, sometimes there's none, but there's usually one or two. And who, who would choose uh, uh, the public health approach, the population? Most people would. It's almost intuitively obvious, and yet, we never do that. We never, ever prioritize public health uh, in, in, any, um, in any important way. And this is particularly true in global health. And the reason it's true in global health is, is that what we take as intuitively obvious for ourselves, we don't do in Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia or somewhere else. So I once posited an idea when I gave this talk about what would happen if, uh, and then I would uh, go on to explain it. But of course, it actually had, since that time, it's happened, and I was right. So basically, what would happen in the United States if there were a complete breakdown in a public health system? So for example, what if you turned on your tap and it was contaminated, which would happen in West Virginia? It was on the front page of the New York Times every day. There are certain things we as a society, as badly as we prioritize public health, we find completely unacceptable. But yet, we, our foreign assistance and everything else is all focused on getting expensive antiretroviral drugs, which can blow the course, the cost, um, access to healthcare, um, TB, malaria. We don't actually focus. Not only don't we focus on strong health systems, but we also don't focus on, uh, on, uh, uh, on public health approaches. Now, when I, when I, I happen to have thought of this last part of the chapter when I got back from a very traditional uh, urban city in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been to those places, but I found out that basically when I come back from it doesn't matter where. It could be Kampala, it could be Delhi, um, it, it could be even parts of you know, rural China, places like that. I just don't feel good. And I actually don't come back as some of my colleagues do with, with malaria, uh, and I don't come back with you know, really, really bad illnesses. But I come back, my tummy's not right, I can't quite breathe well because of all the diesel smoke. I just 
feel bad, and it takes me a while to get back. But hey, I come to Chapel Hill, feeling good. <laughs> Go to Berkeley, Oslo, fantastic. Melbourne, whoa, really, really good. And there's a reason, because in none of those places did I see any doctors or have any interaction with the healthcare system. But there was a reason why I feel good in certain places and, and not in others. And it's just that simple clar clarifying realization, I think, that uh, makes a very big difference. So what would global health with justice look like? One example I, I like to give was I'm on this um, zealot the tobacco control email list. It only has about eight people on it from around the world. The really most ardent anti-tobacco people. And they're always like arguing with one another. Um, and the latest thing they're arguing about is electronic cigarettes, which they really disagree on violently. Um, but at the time, everybody was agreeing on what's called end games in tobacco. The end games in tobacco are basically around the idea is that in a lot of modern uh, cities around the world, uh, we've managed to reduce tobacco to 20%, even down to 15, 17, 15% prevalence, but you know, hovering around that figure. Um, but we seem to be at a point where we've got resistance to our traditional uh, tools. Um, I mean, it might be that the plain packaging rules in, in Australia would, would, might take us up a bit, but still. So, end games in tobacco are a lot of innovative things about getting prevalence of smoking down to 5% or less. Uh, and I won't go into what they are, but I just thought I was usually, I'm very diffident on, the, on this listserv because, you know, I'm not really that. You know, you know, as, I'm not that advanced as they are in the control. So, but, I, but I'm an ethicist. And so I asked them an ethical question. So I said, okay, let's, let me ask this in a hypothetical. Suppose you could get in America or in any society, uh, you, could, you could win your end game. That is, you've got smoking prevalence down to 5%. But there were pockets of people where it still was lingering relatively high. The mentally ill, for example, smoke, I think, one out of every three cigarettes in the United States. Um, prisoners, the poor. And because smoking, like most diseases, are really a bun of gratitude to the poor, I said, would that be all right with you if we could do that? Every single person said yes. And so what do you have there if you win your end game? In that circumstance, you have global health, but you don't have justice. And the idea is, and of course, you could have justice without global health. That is, you could, you could, you could, you could target the poor so much that you lower their rate and not lower very much the rich's rate, and you have more equity. But you wouldn't have health. And so, what you want is your ideal state of health with justice. Um, and that's a good example of that. So how do we get there? Well, if you think about President Obama or any president or any politician in the United States, or for that matter, anywhere in the world, what is the one word that they can't say? Reallocation. They can't, they can't have a redistributive policy, even if they do. So most of the things Obama wants to do are, in their way, redistributive. You change the tax system, uh, you change um, uh, 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 welfare and other social supports, which is basically a form of redistribution, but he will never say it. And, because, and from an ethical point of view, when we think about equity, we tend to think about distributive, distributive justice. Um, and distributed justice is very important, but as you can see with President Obama and others, it's really hard to do politically because it's, it's just very controversial. So one of the things that uh, occurred to me is, is how could you get to justice uh, without relying solely on redistribution? Now don't get me wrong, 
you need redistribution, and there's no way you're going to get equity without sort of, in fact, a lot of redistribution. But one of the things that struck me about the public health approach is, is that, in many ways, you can embed justice in the environment. If you get rid of malarial mosquitoes, everybody who goes outside, whether they're rich or poor, will have the same benefit. Uh, the same as if you have clean water or, 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 no, or no rubbish in the streets or san decent sanitation systems. Now, of course, still, place matters, as people have told me, and income still will matter, and you will still need redistribution. But one of the cool things about this Rawlsian thought experiment is that it gets us a little way toward justice and not just toward health. So that's really what I wanted to talk about. How much time do I have left, if any? Okay, so I want to leave time for questions. So maybe what I'll do is just use Ebola uh, as uh, kind of a case study too. Uh, and there, there, there had, when I wrote the book, I, I did mention Ebola because there have been uh, over 25 outbreaks of Ebola in Sub-Saharan Africa, and only in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's only in Sub-Saharan African seas. Um, since 1976. But I didn't write much about it um, because in every one of those cases we were able to quickly contain it, even in poor countries. And so the question is, well, what makes this different? Well, in my view, about this Ebola outbreak in West Africa is, changes everything in global health. I think it's really, that's what I try to talk about in the Lancet article, that if we don't, if we don't change direction after this, then uh, it will be a huge missed opportunity. So what made it different? Well, I mean, some, some of it you'll know, of course. One of the things that made it different is the fact that it got into, not, it wasn't contained in a rural area. Um, uh, apparently, what happened in this case um, was that there was a, a, a two-year-old uh, Ghanaian child um, that contracted Ebola in a rural area. Um, most likely, um, I mean, it's, we don't know exactly the, the, the uh, mechanism, but basically hemorrhagic fevers in Ebola reside in, um, uh, in animal communities. It's a zoonotic disease. And it's thought to be um, uh, fruit bats that are that are the, the vector, um, possibly a uh, a primate ate the fruit bat, became infected, um, and uh, bush meat was fed to the young child. Uh, then his family and uh, and contacts around him were infected, and they then migrated to major capital cities. And so, you, and that's what made it different. Uh, it was, an, it's an urban outbreak. It wasn't caught early. It wasn't contained early. And also, it was in a very poor urban center with highly fragile health systems. Two out of three of the affected states, uh, uh, Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, uh, are post-conflict states. All three have, uh, are ranked lowest in global development. And so it was a recipe um, for um, problems. So, so what, what did we learn? Well, first of all, we learned that uh, earlier is better. I mean, it was literally a half a year since the first um, transnational spread of the Ebola. The first transnational spread, I believe, from Guinea to um, Liberia. Or my Sierra Leone first. Uh, and before the WHO put out its Ebola roadmap, and it was five months after, before they declared an international emergency of public health concern under the international health regulations. And this should have, this should have been the moment where the WHO showed why it was created in 1948, and why its constitution calls it the leading global uh, public health leader 
coordinating uh, the world. Then Margaret Chan, the director, said something. She, I, I do admire her, but she basically said something that was completely off tone. She said, well, WHO isn't a first responder. We're not a rapid responder. The countries have to do it for themselves. But how could Sierra Leone and other countries like that have done this for themselves? And so if, if it's true that CDC was formed for this reason, I believe CDC has shown now why it was created. But WHO didn't. It was just a complete failure of leadership. And frankly, member states, the United States, um, the European Union, Australia, just ignored it for the longest time. <clears throat> and I went on to PBS NewsHour, my sons really love this because I think I'm really anti-American. And, and, uh, and, 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 and the moderator on NewsHour, the first question they asked me, well, what do you think of, the United, of President Obama sending troops into Liberia? So the first thing that popped into my mind was, I'm very proud of my country. You know, we were too little, we were too late, but at least we did it when others didn't. And I think that needs to be said. We, you know, I think we need to give ourselves a, a pat on the back. You know, there are problems. We talked about it dinner last night and things. But, but still, it's done. So international leadership, global leadership, is one of, the, one of the failures. And I talked about that in the last. The second thing is, if, if there were three things you could have done to prevent it then and prevent it in the future, to me, those three things are so clear. First, I think we, that we ought to have had, under the WHO's auspices, a, an emergency contingency fund um, for surge capacity and a declared uh, emergency. In, in 2011, the WHO Independent Commission uh, on the International Health Regulations after the H1N1 uh, emergency recommended such a surge capacity. WHO never acted. Had it, we could have surged quickly and we were under control. The second thing is, is and we had an op-ed in the LA Times about this, would be just to have a reserve, a health care reserve workforce because human resources are a big deficiency in these countries. They have almost no doctors and nurses to begin with, and hundreds have died, certainly more than 100, about 140 in the last count. Uh, and so they're completely depleted. So we need a reserve workforce that are well-trained, that understand um, uh, uh, how to work in developing country settings, and can be rapidly mobilized. One of the interesting things we discussed at dinner last night was the fact that one of the things that President Obama's announcement said, and it was regrettable, as, as, as admirable as the announcement was, is that the military would not be in care providing capacity. And I think that was political because they were afraid well, what if what if the army top came back with the war. Um, but they should have done that. So the reserve of workforce would be a second. And then the third is a longer term, uh, in, in a Lancet article two weeks ago, I hope for a longer term um, uh, health systems fund under the WHO for sustainable, strong health systems. Um, I think that that should ultimately morph into a global fund for health rather than a global fund for AIDS, TB, and malaria. And actually, Mark Dival, who's the head of the global fund, who actually used to work in my institute at Georgetown, um, uh, believes in it, but he can't, he, can't, he can't implement it. Anyway, if you had those three things, it would go a long way to improving health around the world, and certainly um, would deal with this problem. And the Ebola issue is not just, it's not just Ebola. Um, women who want to have, who, who, who need childcare, uh, birth attendants, can't get them because there's no hospitals. Uh, if you've got cancer, heart disease, malaria, tuberculosis. You can't get it because the resources are so thin. So I think we know what to do. It was a failure of leadership. It was a failure of the international community. And if we can make some bright promise out of this crisis, we will act. 
um, or we won't, and it will be very sad. Okay. So, um, so, thank you so much, Larry, for providing us with a talk that was topical, it was inspiring, gruel. I want to bring two things to people's attention before we start the question and answer. The first is this new book, Global Health Law. You got to hear the end of it. The lead up to that ending is worth reading, having just made my way all the way through what is a remarkably heavy book. I would encourage you to pick it up and it's for sale outside. We have the author here who will be gracing us with a book signing after this is over. Secondly, we're we going to be doing a question and answer session for about a half an hour over here. We have now freed our speaker from the microphone, so we will use the microphone for speakers, and I'd ask that you line up over here in order to ask those questions. To the extent that you are shy about asking those questions, we have a Twitter hashtag here. Feel free to include your questions there. It's UNCHHR. And so if I can lead off and ask the first question while people line up over here, and here we've included UNC Public Policy, UNC Public Health, and L. Gostin, so that you know who it is that you are addressing, thanking, commiserating with as we address what seems to be an unstoppable global health crisis. And so in trying to understand what human rights brings to this discussion, I want to get a sense, and I'm hoping that it can draw on some of the earlier chapters of the book. What does framing global health policy around the right to health bring to these remarkable public health responses, particularly in regions of the world that cannot provide for themselves? And so I'm thinking about what a right to health brings to it, a notion of international obligations, the entire world's responsibility to those who cannot respond for themselves. Did you want me to answer that now, then? Sure. Yes? Well, I mean, you know, I'm a law professor, and um, I was actually very reluctant to ground the book on the right of health. Um, because law professors, by and large, are not all that keen on socioeconomic rights. And the reason they're not um, is not because of I don't believe in them, um, but because they are, they're vague, they have um, uh, very little enforcement power, they're progressively realized, and the like. Um, but I came to be persuaded that I ought to, and the reason is, is that I thought two things. One, it is the only universally applicable uh, treaty that for health there is in the world. And so I think the right to health brings with this, brings a universal, universality to it that's not just ethical, but also is based upon international law, that is theoretically. But secondly, what I wanted to do in the book is actually try to make the right to health work. I wanted it to do its job. Uh, and so, I try to uh, uh, think about uh, uh, forms of good governance and accountability to effectuate the right to health, um, which I think are um, extremely important. Um, and I uh, talk about a framework convention on global health that operationalizes it and the like. And the other thing is that I wanted to, my conception, I've been even more so since I finished the book, but my conception of the right to health now is much more a population-based right than an individual right, which is not the way people think of human rights very much at all. And in fact, I have some criticism about individual uh, litigation on, on the right to health, at least in some circumstances. Obviously, a case like the Treatment Action Campaign the case in South Africa was, was really good. It, it got. Uh, it paved the way for um, antiretroviral medication for um, pregnant women and, and newborns. Uh, but if you look at Brazil and other countries, 
and you ask yourself the question, well, who gets, who gets to bring this to the core? Very often it's a privileged person, somebody that's got access to money and to power. And also what they may be doing is, is um, they, they may be asking for a very expensive medication for themselves um, and in a world where we do have scarce resources, and you might, you know, that, that money might be taken from the national health budget, say, for a vaccination, uh, for, or for, say, child birth, uh, or other kinds of needs that are, are equally important. And so it just, it, it just gives me pause, and so I wanted to shape that in the way the right to health was, and also to, to give it a bit of heft and, and, and interest. Uh, and I think that would be Larry, speak a little more about, <clears throat> I, I've heard you talk on um, the, the concept of donor nations, foreign assistance as charity, or even NGO assistance as charity, and the paradox that as that, as that money flows or resources flow into the recipient country, then the domestic uh, per capita expenditures on health decrease. Yeah. And how we change that paradigm to sort of enlighten self-interest for all. Well, thank you, Gene. It's actually a very good question. And that's the whole first chapter. We come up to the first chapter is about that. A, a few things about that. I mean, first of all, I think that the paradigm of, of um, Global health assistance as charity, as philanthropy, um, is badly flawed. Um, and it's badly flawed for a number of reasons. One, because it makes it seem like one, one side of the equation is the beneficent person and the other is the weak recipient. And I think that that is a bad characterization. Uh, and secondly, if, if it is charity, then it means that the donor, not the donee, gets to decide what they're going to use it for. And, and it may not be the priorities of the country at all. And it's not sustainable. I mean, if it's charity, I give it this year, and I give you a program for a grade AIDS clinic, and next year I take it back. Um, so charity doesn't work, and it means that uh, countries themselves can't plan in the long term, because they don't know what, the, what they're going to get. The other problem is what Gene was talking, referring to as the substitution effect. Basically, for every dollar that's given in global health assistance, you know, anywhere from 60 to 80 or 90 cents of that dollar is reduced from the national health budget. Uh, and so you don't really gain much, not to mention the money that gets gets devoted to corruption and things like that, which is, which is another problem. And so, what is the dynamic that would change this? When I first got into global health, I thought there was only one important question. Um, and I realized how wrong I am, I was. And basically, that one important question was, the, the poor, or the one, the one observation is, is poor countries can't afford to do good things for their health of their people, and the rich countries don't have the political will to do it. And then I realized that was just complete white guilt rubbish. Um, and that you absolutely need to hold states accountable for the health of their population. So for example, if you look at African heads of state, uh, in the Abuja Declaration, which was recently reaffirmed, uh, they promised a certain percentage of their G GDP going into health. Almost none of them have actually done it. And so we have to hold them accountable. At the same time, I think there needs to be a duty of justice in uh, richer countries to provide uh, a, a uh, I, I, the, the supplementation that we need to help build that capacity, like a health systems fund, things like that. So it's called global solidarity, mutual solidarity, where both parties have an obligation. Now, 
you did mention, Jean, I was talking about states, you did mention NGOs, and what you could have easily mentioned was the Gates Foundation, because that is the big uh, gorilla in the room, for a better metaphor. Um, and uh, I won't go there, but you can ask me about the gorilla if you want. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. Um, so I, sometimes I find that global health is local health, and that even in Chapel Hill, it can be a little bit difficult to breathe. Um, and I wonder what it is about the Black Feet Reservation that makes it so hard to survive as a male you know, in, in this reservation compared to other reservations, and then also what it is that can be done for the kids as this man blew it. Okay, I mean, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Let me just, it's, I mean, it's almost impossible to describe unless you've been there. First of all, Blackfeet Reservation is in the middle of the most beautiful countryside in America. Very, very beautiful all around it, um, with affluent communities. But then you get into the reservation and everything completely changed, like going across the railroad track. So what changes? Well, many things. I mean, I was, so for example, I was at the Indian Health Service Hospital, and I was just asking the travelers, I said, there's a, I, I, there's a lagoon outside, what are they pumping into it? Raw sewage. Then you go to where the kids are playing, and another raw sewage going, and it's filled with rubbish. Just kind of, you know, garbage everywhere. Um, during the school time, the kids are out. They're not, they're not going to school. Where are their fathers? Their fathers are, com are completely drunk out of their minds, smoking in gambling casinos. Um, uh, the mothers are trying their best, um, but it's hopeless because women have no power on these reservations. I, at, at one time, I was talking to some of the women, and I was telling them, you know, what do you think we can do for your kids? You know, and they had some great ideas, and they just said nobody pays any attention to them. All the tribal leaders are men. Uh, and so basically, I said, okay, we're, we went and we, we actually commandeered the local Indian radio station, and I just let them speak um, to, to, to their population. But when I try to get the attention of tribal leaders, they don't, they don't care. They don't care at all. And in fact, the only thing that anybody seems to care about there is the fact that they want more money for the hospital for the Indian Health Service. So it's okay if everybody gets cancer, as long as there's a hospital they can go to when they get the cancer. You know? It's okay that we can have casinos, you know, because maybe you'll have one or two people from outside the reservation using it, but mostly the people within the reservation. And I don't know if you can, you know, if you can tell by my, the way I look, but, you know, I'm a health fanatic. And I was starving in this reservation. So I would get up in the morning, go for my usual run, and I'm very sad looking at this, everything that was going on. And then come in for breakfast, and basically for breakfast it would either be one day it would be just really creamy, greasy donuts. Um, then, usually around 10 o'clock, we're coming cheese and pepperoni and pizza. And so, so far I can't eat. And so then I thought, well, I'll go to the local store. There's only one there. I'll try to buy something. Nothing. The only thing you could see is cigarettes, alcohol, and really greasy, fried, nasty things. <laughs> there was some white bread, but I just didn't. And so they said, I said, so I'm starving. What's for lunch? <clears throat> oh, we're just we're bringing in Mexican food. Oh, okay, so I'll eat the, the beans and rice. No beans and rice. Just all, you know, the most dry, cheesy, nasty stuff that you could get. And then I would go to the travel and I'd say, what's all this about? You're killing your people. You're killing them. And they said, don't you come in here and tell me what we should do, what, what our traditions are. I said, well, hold on a minute. What did your ancestors eat? What did, 
They were eating berries and they were eating vegetables and fruits. Were they sitting around all day and obese? No, they were on their ponies, they were hunting. It's not the tradition, it's basically, it's us, the Westerners, have just pushed our ways. And so as a result, and not to mention smoke, tobacco, alcohol, and drugs, as John has said, is the, is the top and bottom of why males die. And because of that, nothing is said to see Native American. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks very much for your talk. Um, so I'm a student of public policy, so I tend to think of things in the way of what can government do. And I wanted to go back to your ideal state of global health and the three biggest pillars you mentioned with health care, um, public health policy, and the social determinants of health. And I have to say I agree with that approach completely. Uh, you mentioned, though, that the emphasis tends to be on that first pillar with uh, medical care being, you know, getting the most attention. And as you're saying that, I wondered if perhaps that's because the the outcomes from that, like, is you can you can see the consequences of that investment much sooner than you can see an investment in education or um, you know cleaning the water system or something like that. And the cynical side of me thinks that, well, maybe policymakers want that quick fix and they want to be able to point to, you know, I, I invested in, in, in hospitals, so um, re-elect me. And I just wanted to get your thoughts, you know, is that, is that true? I know you're too cynical and... No, it's not cynical at all, it's absolutely true, but it's even worse than you think. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> so then I wonder if I can get your thoughts on how to well, shift. Part of this is, you know, when you're a congressperson and, and you know, you, you send money to a hospital. There is a hospital one day your name will be on it. And you can say, look, I built this wonderful hospital. You hear them say this all the time. Um, and, uh, and, and so it is very, it's very material, it's visible. And, and also it's the short-term horizon in politics and public health is for the long term. You may not be in office, all that kind of thing is true. But I think there's also other things involved because if ordinary people, it's not just political leaders want that too. And the reason is part of it is the rescue imperative. We'll spend whatever it takes to get the little girl out of the well. We'll do two, you know, double heart transplant on, on the other kid. Um, and it's just, you, you can't stop it. I mean, I remember just a few months ago, I, mean, I went on television and I, after, remember this, um, a uh, kid that was denied the liver transplant because he wasn't on the, he, uh, he, he couldn't get on the adult donor list. And so I got on television and said, you know, it's exactly right, you can't, a court, one judge can't just privilege this one kid and, and change the whole US system uh, in, in place. I came back and my wife said, you know, you are the most worst horrible. You're not going to let that happen. You know, it's hard because we like to rescue people that we can see, but a hundred inner city kids that don't get vaccinations, so they're statistical lives. We don't see them. Uh, hi, Professor Gunston. Thanks for coming here today. Uh, I have a question regarding the Ebola epidemic. Uh, epidemic. So uh, you talked about the um, the World Health Organization largely failing and addressing it on an international level. Do you see any other international organizations kind of taking the reins on that effort um, to, to bring about a multilateral effort, or do you just see the WHO remaining in that position but doing it effectively? Well, you know, one of the sad parts of the goal um, was this how WHO was sidelined. Other, other agencies did come forward, too late, too little. But, you know, in, in its 25 year history, MSF, it would have been unthinkable for them to ask for the military. Unthinkable. I've talked to them about this. And yet, they were clamoring for the military. So who stepped in? Uh, the United States. Uh, then I, with, with MSF and others, called for a, a, a UN Security Council resolution. Got that. So these were other agencies stepping in. But it's, first of all, it should never have come to that. 
even though it was necessary. But secondly, it's very sad to fight your own double way joke. I mean, what is, this, what is the U.S. military and Security Council doing, you know, containing an epidemic? Why did we create the WHO? It was the very first specialized agency of the UN. Um, and so, unfortunately, what we said actually happened. Um, but it sidelined WHO, but it had to happen. Uh, thanks for the stop. Um, you talked about the three pieces that contributed to health, uh, the social determinants uh, piece, the um, health care part, the public health. Is there a way of making, what, what do you think of the David Kennedy kind of uh, approach to essentially capitating care or holding, uh, trying to move the interests of um, health care providers uh, towards population health status? There's a little bit of that, but their population definition is different than our population definition. What if you risk suggest to people and risk suggest now pay them for that? And then they realize that they're not able to get that higher amount of money unless they improve the health of the population. So they'd be forced to do more than health care and actually put the population as a whole. Or reimburse them. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm aware of I'm, I'm I'm absolutely aware of that. I and mean, I think it's a I think it's a clever thing to do. I it isn't the way it wouldn't be I'm not an economist, so and maybe that's the reason. It wouldn't, have been, it wouldn't be the first thing I would do, because I think that there are certain services that are quintessentially governmental and that you don't, you don't deal with on you know, a, 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 pay, a pay system. But, that is a, but if you are going to pay for performance, at least you should have a performance that matters for the health of the population. That's what that does. And so, uh, I, I, I mean, it's, but from a public health perspective, it's very difficult to, to, to be against it. Um, yes, and, and the Affordable Care Act does it to, to, to a very low, low, low extent. And in any case, whenever you're talking about per capita payments and payments for that, at, at ground, it's about payments for, you know, for, for health care. I know you, can, you, sh you do, you can, and should, all that, you should shift the incentives, but I think, they're just basic public health infrastructure that government should do. So the answer is yes. It's, it's a very, very good idea. Um, I would do more. <laughs> I would tell them that they like it or they want it to end. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for coming and speaking today. So I'm going to ask about the gorilla in the room. Um, so I know for me, nonprofits are something that are really important, and I think that a lot of people find their charitable acts to be very, I don't know, successful in some way because they're actually able to help at a very like minute level with community-based interventions in some ways. But how can we, as nonprofits, work to try and become better global allies in this push for global governance for our right to health? Well, you know, I, mean, I think uh, there's a role for both. I mean, uh, civil society uh, has many um, has many benefits, um, but two of those benefits are one is, is that they they take care of their members and they take care of members of poor communities, and secondly, they um, uh, they advocate for change. And I think if we advocate for change, um, where we can make more of a difference.
side if you have questions additionally. It's going to be signing books, which are available for purchase. And we have a reception outside. And thank you all for coming. So thank you again. We look forward to seeing you for our report. Health and Human Rights Lecture next year. That was very odd. <laughs>